Hi, folks. Welcome to our panel, Breakthroughs in Machine Learning. Uh, we've been talking a lot about Google's long-term vision for AI and all the work we've been doing for the past decade and a half on machine learning. Um, and this is important because our users and your users expect the impossible. They want technology that they can talk to naturally just the way you would talk to a person. Obviously not possible today, but we're moving in that direction. Um, and I think a point that often gets missed is that Google isn't just working on incremental improvements to products using known machine learning techniques. We actually have teams doing fundamental work on improving the state of the art in machine learning. They're working right here in Mountain View and in, uh, in, in our locations around the world. So you're going to hear from some of these folks. I think if you're also getting your hands into the, the deep thick of things and you're working with TensorFlow, you're working on machine learning models, you can maybe learn something from the war stories, the, the challenges that you hear they've gone through. If you're a developer who just wants to use what they've packaged up in the cloud machine learning APIs that we offer, uh, you can get a good sense of which things are working well and how you might use these in your products. So I hope you enjoy it. We're going to start with Francoise. Hi. So my name is Francoise. I work on speech recognition. And um, I joined Google about 10 years ago. And it may be hard to remember, but 10 years ago, there was no iPhone. There was no Android, right? So speech recognition was used mostly in, mostly in call centers. And it was this kind of annoying thing, right? That it wasn't a lot of fun. So I came to Google with two goals in mind. The first one was to make speech recognition fun and useful. And the second one was to make it work really well for everybody on Earth. So with that, we're now 10 years later. And about 20%, almost 20% of the queries uh, that come into Android phones are made by voice. So we take that as a real success. And of course, we just released the Cloud Speech API that allows all of you to develop more fun products with speech recognition. Um, we currently cover about 80 languages and locales, which could reach to about 4 billion people. And um, you know, you could ask me, like, why did it take 10 years to get there? After all, speech recognition should be very easy. A, a one-year-old can do speech recognition, right? And a few years later, they will be able to transcribe it too. But um, if you look at the um, uh, if you look at the different users and the different different scenarios, uh, they have different needs and they speak differently. So I was hoping to play a few. Um, Sound bites there. Can someone there click on the video? When stinger season in the Great Barrier Reef. How long have you been able to stay at the San Francisco bar? So this person is speaking Hungarian. What? No, it doesn't. Elephant make. So. I mean, seriously, this is, this is the type of data that we should expect, right? And, and we want to serve these users, no matter who they are. So we do the best we can, but sometimes, obviously, we get it wrong. And uh, this is a case that was uh, recently reported to us. A user speaking Spanish said, llama Juan. They wanted to call their friend, but we recognize Yamaha Juan, as if this person went to buy a piano or something, right? Um, the next one is an example you might have guessed by now. I'm a French speaker, so I try my products in French. And a couple of years ago, when I said to the recognizer, qu'est-ce qui se passe, I would, rec I would get this result. It sounds the same, but you know the spelling is completely butchered. And then I came across this example in Korean. If you look at the strings, we're actually getting every single hangul, every single character right, but the white spaces are not at the right space. And that means something very different, as you can see from the translation. So OK, we make mistakes, but this is speech recognition. Speech recognition is machine learning. Machine learning can fix everything, right? So we can get it right. Um, but before we go more into how we get it right, I want to give you just a, a very high level look at how speech recognition works. So you have a speech waveform, 
that comes into the system and you're trying to get a sentence out of it. So in the system, there are three models. There's an acoustic model that takes snippets of that soundtrack and tries to find distribution of probability over phonemes, the individual sounds of a language. Then there's a pronunciation model that takes those phonemes and makes words out of them. And then there's a language model that strings words together with probabilities. If you want to see this as an equation, it's essentially saying that we're trying to find the word sequence that has the highest probability given the acoustic observation. And with a little bit of math, you can decompose that into three probabilities, a product of those three, uh, which correspond to the different models. So all this to say, this is a statistical model. There are three different models. Everything in there is statistical and can be learned from data. And the first one, the acoustic model, is something I want to talk a little bit more about because uh, for a long time, for many decades actually, we were using a technology called uh, Gaussian mixture models, which served the community of speech recognition very well for a long time. But um, in 2012, we changed that to neural networks. And it took us a while to get there because those neural networks take time to train, they take time, they're, they're, they're big, they're, uh, you know, if you want to get the right latency characteristics out of the system, you have to optimize a lot. But eventually we got there and we got huge accuracy improvements out of switching to neural networks. But in addition to that, the thing that's interesting is that it restarted a revolution in the field. By having that infrastructure in place, we started innovating the type of architecture of um, the, the actual structure of the neural networks and the way we're using them. And year after year, and I would say month after month, we came out with new structures that were always more powerful than the previous generation. So we went from deep neural networks to recurrent neural networks with uh, LSTM. From there, we added convolutional layers that allow us to better deal with noise and reverberances in this, uh, in this room. And from there to uh, connectionist temporal classification, CTC, which I will show a little bit more about. Um, this type of improvement, this type of um, uh, yeah, improvement in the structures result in improvements in quality. So over 2015, over all the different groups of languages that we cover, we've had accuracy improvements. And uh, going back to CTC, like I, I said, the CTC has allowed us to decrease the latency of our speech recognizer quite a bit. And that means that when you're speaking to your recognizer, you get your response much faster and gives you that snappiness that feels comfortable. Now, of course, um, you know, sometimes things are complicated and we went through several lessons in our life as a group doing speech recognition at Google. Um, but for you to really appreciate those lessons, I want to give you just a tiny bit more about how the speech recognizer works. We're using, like I said, a lot of data to train our models and there are different sources. They go into training those models. The models go into the recognizer and we're using the data that comes out of the recognizer to feed back into the models because that's data that's very well matched to what we're trying to do. The problem is that that data occasionally has typos, you know, various problems, data is never clean. Um, and that caused the issues that we've seen. So one day in Korean, we started seeing this word, kua appearing all over the place in our recognizer outputs. And we didn't quite understand why, so we started analyzing. And we realized that it was the voices of little kids. It's people making voice queries, but there are kids in the background. And those little voices, you know, high pitch, would, the recognizer didn't know what to do with it, so it found a word that, had, that, that was vowel heavy, like kwa, kwa, right? And it tried to pick that word, and, and it started recognizing all over the place. And because of the feedback loop I was showing you, it just fed back into the system and grew and grew. But before we could fix it, in British English, we started seeing this word KD, KD, KD. Now, can one of you guess where that one is coming from? Someone said it? The train. Subway. So it's people using their phone on the train, on the subway, and it's right? And the recognizer already know what to do, and that put something. And then the last one, it's uh, maybe a little embarrassing, but it was this word. <laughs> and uh, 
when we looked more into it, what was happening is people taking their phone and, and then they talk. Take a deep breath, right? So you have that blow of air, and then it goes quickly on the vowel and the click, and that's what the recognizer found. So as soon as I became aware of that one, I knew that we had to do something about it. Um, and we fix these type of problems by actually putting more human knowledge into our systems. We started um, using more linguists, more, using more human resources to try to format the data well and um, to transcribe the data correctly. And we built like, very sophisticated guidelines to get our data transcribed correctly so that we could leverage that human knowledge. With just three million annotated waveforms, we can train our acoustic models, learn new pronunciations from the data, augment the size of our language modeling training set, and all that gives you improvements. But now, with 3 million waveforms, we said, well, we can do a lot of things. How about 30 million? So we just embarked into an effort to transcribe 33,000 hours of human speech. It takes 600 people to do that in a reasonable time frame. But with this data, we're dreaming about new architectures, more complicated, more tight, that we can use. And we think that with that, maybe we can solve the big dream of speech recognition of really making it work for every person on Earth. Thank you. With, I pass it to Andrew, who will talk about graphs and pumpkins. Thanks, Francoise. Hi, everyone. I'm Andrew. Um, so uh, this is the usual picture you have of machine learning. We have, some, we have some reds. We have some blues. We'd like to try to learn a model that'll separate the reds from the blues. And then when new input comes along, we'll apply our model, and we'll guess whether it's a red or a blue. So that is not the framework that we're going to talk about today. Today, we're going to talk about something a little bit different for the next 10 minutes. So here, um, here's me. I'm there alone solo. And you have to guess uh, what it is that I like to do. And, uh, so from the data, it's very hard to guess. Maybe, maybe hats are my thing. It's not much more that you can get from the representation. Maybe you'd gather some features and uh, maybe generate a training set, learn some models, and then try to predict what it is that I like to do. But we're going to talk about another approach. We're going to talk about what could I do if I understood not just this data object um, alone, but if I could put it into context of its neighborhood within my data set. And so we'll add. Um, relationships to other pieces of data. In this case, it's my kids. And uh, now it's possible to draw some inferences. Like maybe what I like to do is to go trick-or-treating with my kids. And uh, so with that intuition that rather than operating in isolation to classify each data object, we should actually make use of the relationships between different data points, even data points that we don't completely understand, we would like to see how far we can, we can go with that idea. And so we have a piece of infrastructure at Google called Expander, which is designed to do exactly this. So this is a large scale platform which is intended to make use of connections that we have between data objects. So let me give you an example. Clearly, I like to go trick or treating. So it would be very helpful if I could recognize pumpkins. So uh, we actually have this great image understanding system at Google. And this is how it works. It's given a bunch of images. And they have training labels on them. And then it learns a deep network, which will be able to recognize new images and recognize objects and images in the future. And uh, so uh, now we hand it the rest of the corpus, which has no labels. And we apply these models, and we get our labels. So looking at this data, you could ask, just how good are the labels that we're starting with? And they're pretty good, but they're not great. right? So one of those is a pumpkin, the one on the left. The one on the right is pumpkin soup. And as you can imagine, if you were a neural network, which you are, it would be pretty hard to be fed that and told to learn a representation of pumpkins and be given these confusing inputs. So what I'm going to tell you about first is a hybrid system that uses graph-based learning and connections in order to figure out the right training data. And then on top of that, applies deep network learning to figure out the right model. So how would we do that? Well, we actually do have connections between these data objects. So between each of these pixel arrays, we've been able to learn embeddings, which capture the semantic similarity of two images. What is the likelihood that these two images have the same object in them? So we can use those edges. You can see on the left, we could propagate the information at the top of the graph that says we have things we know to be pumpkins through those edges and confirm our initial intuition that the thing in the bottom was a pumpkin. 
But when we look at the right-hand side of the graph, we can do the same thing. We can propagate a couple of instances of known not pumpkins through the graph to help us conclude that our label on the pumpkin soup is questionable. Maybe we ought to rethink it. So we can use this approach to remove about 40% of the training data that initially we were using to learn image classifiers. And by removing that data, we actually got a 9% lift in our metrics on image classification, which improves what we can do for Google Photos and Google Search. So from there, let's, let's um, take a look at how this works. So um, this is kind of the one equation form of graph propagation. Um, what we're trying to do is write down a penalty function that tells us how well we're doing with respect to the neighborhoods that are in my data. And so you can see there's a term, LU minus LV, which says how far apart are the labels of nodes U and V in the data. And I will weight that by the strength of the connection between them, W, U, V, and I'll add it up over my entire data set. That's the penalty that says how far away I am from properly respecting the semantics of the edges that I have, the similarity information. And then I'll try to minimize that. It's actually quite easy to minimize that. Um, the equation at the bottom show that if what I do is for each of my data objects, I take a look at its neighborhood, I use the labels that I have for the neighbors in order to update my label. I do that for everything in the graph, and then I do it again and again. Information walks through the graph, and it converges provably to the optimal assignment for that cost function. And so from that starting point, you can now layer in a lot of complexity and additional features into the system. So that's the algorithmic side. But there's also a system side here, because what we would like to do in order to build these systems is operate at the scale of billions of different data objects simultaneously, and the label spaces that we might apply could actually have billions of distinct labels as well. And we'd like to do this on graphs, so the penalties that we're measuring are measured over trillions of edges, trillions of connections between the objects. So that's what we've built in order to make use of these techniques. Now we have these tools, let me give you a couple of other examples. So you heard in the keynote about um, smart reply in the context of messaging apps, and I hope people have had the chance to try it out in the context of inbox right now. Um, here the, uh, the vertices of this graph are possible responses that you might be able to, to send, and the edges represent similarity. So it could come from um, maybe a distributional similarity to say these responses are used in the same context, or it could come from lexical similarity say they have the same words, or uh, similarity based on word embeddings. When I've got the graph, I can now run Expander in order to generate clusters, and that will tell me about similar phrases that have the same meaning. The personalization features that were alluded to in the keynote can then choose an appropriate choice here for the particular user in their context, and the understanding of those different clusters can be used to make sure that we offer diverse choices so that we're not just picking three ways of saying the same thing. So that's great for English. We can do the same thing in other languages as well. So this is an example just specifically for responses that are greetings. So in English, maybe I can say, hi, how's things? What's up? And we have connections between those, like the ones that we talked about on the last slide. But in French, I might say, ça va, salut. And uh, I can start to build connections from the French variant to the English variant using the models that power Google Translation. Maybe how's things and need some young can be connected together based on translate edges. And now I can start to flow semantic meaning across a multilingual graph. And that would allow us to build data structures that could then um, power features like Smart Reply in other languages like uh, Portuguese, Indonesian, Spanish, even, even English. Let's do one more, one more example. Now in the space of search queries. So um, of course I'm interested in, in trick-or-treating. I'd like to uh, tell, my, um, tell my, my kids some stories about Halloween. So I'll go to Google and ask some questions. And my hope is that Google will be able to give me this featured snippet back that will answer my question directly. So we, uh, we have that capability. We would love to be able to expand the coverage and respond to more questions in that way. So this is a graph whose vertices are queries, and the edges represent the likelihood that two queries would be answer, answered by the same information response. And I can now flow information through that graph in order to improve the coverage. You can see that the stronger edges, the ones that are solid, are places where I'm more confident about the meaning. The dotted edges might represent things that have some drift to them. So I have to be very careful about exactly how I do the propagation. 
But having done that, we're able to automatically discover uh, semantically equivalent questions for more than a billion queries in search. So let me wrap up now just by saying that we've been using machine learning on graphs to understand natural language, to understand queries, to understand images and other media objects. And uh, we also, you probably heard in the keynote about photo reply, where we can actually recommend responses to images, um, just built on the same technology. And we can use the same techniques in order to generate concise models that can actually be applied in Android Wear on a device in order to do things like recommending an appropriate response response, um, as we saw in the, in, the, in the keynote on Wednesday. So with that, we found, um, we found a lot of great impact from graph-based learning, especially in scenarios where you have a lot of data, labels are expensive, but you understand something about the connections between your data objects. So with that, let me pass to Maya to talk about Glassbox. Great, so Andrew was just talking about questions and answers and doing that automatically. We're gonna do that non-automatically for you right here in about uh, 10, 15 minutes. So if you guys have some questions that you're thinking of, uh, we'll have you come up to the mics in about, about 10 minutes. Uh, but first, I'm gonna talk about glass box learning. Sometimes people complain that machine learning feels a little black box. And so our team is sort of dedicated to, to, to making it a little more transparent. And as Francoise uh, said earlier, it's important to get the human knowledge into the machine learning. We don't just want to pour a lot of examples in and see what happens. Sometimes we know a little better. So let me start with a, a story. About two years ago, we've been working on a video recommendation system uh, using machine learning. And we were about to launch. The tests look good. Live experiments look good. Everything was fine. And then the manager noticed that if they search for Gangnam Style, and they watch Gangnam Style, which is this Korean hip hop video that was very popular at the time. Uh, a suggestion in the top 10 would come up called Il Pacino Pio, which was this little Italian musical video where they make animal sounds. And uh, they were very concerned. So the manager was like, whoa, wait, stop. You know, what's going on here? What is your machine learning doing? I don't know if we can trust it. So um, what happened? Well, we'll get back to that. But let it motivate the breakthrough that I'm going to talk about for the next few minutes. And to talk about that breaks too, let's ask another question, which is, how far will you go for hot coffee? Um, so you can see here we're in the Shuala Amphitheater. And you know, how many results should we show you if you're looking for coffee? How, how far would you really want to go? So let's take this example and just build ourselves a little machine learning system uh, real time here. And we're just going to mock this up. So since we're doing machine learning, we need examples. And we're just going to do a 1D case here, because I draw best in one dimension. So let's say I show you some coffee one kilometer away, and you're like, yeah, that looks great. We show coffee a little further away. You're like, no, I'm not going to go that far. And we get a few different examples. And then, like our forefathers before us, we fit a linear line. And we're like, great. Now we kind of know uh, what's going on. Except we're Google. We have big data. So we have lots of data. We think we can do something better. So we fit a more flexible model, maybe with an SVM or a neural net. And uh, wow, that doesn't look good at all, does it? So what's gone wrong here? Well, big data is also noisy data, right? So we have to watch out that we don't be, be too flexible. Um, probably you know the right answer. It's to regularize. So you regularize. This still looks a little funny, though, right? Do people believe this is really sort of the true curve of how far people are willing to go for coffee? Doesn't, doesn't seem quite right to me. So we could try to regularize harder, but we're going to get back to linear pretty fast. Um, let, let's do something else. Let's just fit a decision tree. OK. Uh, still looking a little problematic. Um, so again, the right answer, we'll, we fit a whole bunch of decision trees. We'll call it a random forest. This will be great. And this is starting to fit things a little better. But it seems a little weird, because I know something as a human, which is that I don't want to walk farther for coffee. And the machine learning isn't picking that up. It's like, oh, this is equal, this is equal, this is a little worse. This is, it's basically overfitting a little, right? So what I'd really like to see is a curve like this. It should be smooth. It should be monotonically decreasing. It should fit the data as well as it can. This is what we expect our machine learning to do. But this isn't necessarily what machine learning is going to do for you. And this is just one dimension. Imagine if we're in a 100-dimensional space or a 1,000-dimensional space. We have noisy examples. We just can't trust that it's going to do sort of the right thing just because we throw a lot of noisy samples at it. So what can we do? Well, we can try to learn monotonic functions. It turns out that this is hard and slow. One of the oldest techniques, isotonic regression, is O of n to the fourth complexity. Anyone ever run an O to the n4 algorithm? Probably not. Um, so, uh, and it dates back a while. The, this is some related work here. The top line there is a 1993 paper, one of the first papers trying to make a neural net be monotonic. 
Uh, and all of these papers here use very tiny data sets and very few number of features because it's really computationally challenging. So at Google, we've developed some new techniques for this. And our new solution uh, is actually a very old solution. Uh, and you guys might, might remember these from, from math class uh, trigonometry. You go to the back of your textbook, and there's a table back there, right? And it's a lookup table, and you're like, oh, sine of 0.3, and you find the closest ones, and you interpolate. Um, this is from a 1619 textbook, so this is a very old idea. So we're going to do that. We're just going to do it in uh, much higher dimensions. So here's an example just in two dimensions. This is a two by two lookup table. It only has four parameters. And here I'm looking at how far I have to go and how good the coffee is. And I've got parameters 0, 0, 0.4, and 1. Of course, I want close, good coffee. And I don't want to go far, even if the coffee is good. Um, <clears throat> what's great about this structure is that because it's so structured, it's fast. And because it's so structured, I can make it monotonic pretty easily. All I need to do is make sure that my lookup table parameters are increasing, then everything in between them will also increase. So this is easy to check and relatively easy to constrain. OK, and how do we actually learn those values? Well, this isn't trig class, so we're not just going to learn sines and cosines. We're going to learn from examples, because this is machine learning. So we're going to go out and get some examples of how happy people are with coffee, and then we're going to say, how do we fit this function, fit these values, so the lookup table matches your examples. And this is just like any other uh, function learning. Um, in fact, we solve with, with another structural risk minimization, just like you would uh, lots of other machine learning systems. You can iterate through all your examples, try to get the loss right. There's some regularizer. And what's new here is that we have a bunch of constraints to enforce that monotonicity for features that humans think should be monotonic. You don't have to do it for everything. But you're like, hey, distance, you guys make sure it's monotonic. And those linear inequalities, um, they, they don't look bad up there. But in practice, it turns out to be around you know, 100,000 or maybe even a million of those linear inequalities that we need to uh, enforce in order to learn really big, complicated models. So uh, you can read more about the details um, in a JMLR paper that's upcoming and in a Colt paper that's upcoming that focuses on how we handle all those constraints. And you can get those papers on archive if you'd like. OK, so we can get fancier. I showed you a two by two lookup table. We can have a much more flexible uh, model if we just have a, a bigger lookup table. We can grow this in dimensions. Here's a three-dimensional lookup table on three features, one of which is categorical in this case. Um, this lookup table structure is going to go as 2 to the d. So at some point, we're going to have some scaling problems. But then we just start to make ensembles. Just like you do ensembles of decision trees, we can make ensembles of lookup tables. And we can make cascader architectures as well. So we can now learn incredibly complicated but flexible monotonic functions if we want, uh, and very fast due to that structure. OK. So to get back to our story, we're about to launch this machine learning system. And someone says, wait, what's going on? How do I know the machine learning is doing the right thing? And the wonderful thing is we knew the machine learning was doing the right thing because we'd forced it to be monotonic. We're like, yeah, don't worry. And we took a look at the data, the features, and the features were good too. It really did seem like there was just some set of people that really wanted to watch Korean hip hop and uh, Italian animal sounds. Um, and as you may have guessed, the answer is two-year-olds. It turned out that these were popular toilet training videos uh, at the time, and that this was a real, a real issue. OK, great. Um, so that's been uh, our session on, on breakthroughs in machine learning.